Hello, my friends. We will begin in this video an introduction to social metacognition. And I love this little saying that I can talk myself into anything. Metacognition is a great, powerful tool, and social metacognition is a very neat application of the process of metacognition. Now, you may ask yourself, what is metacognition? Well, metacognition refers to an individual's thinking about his or her own thoughts. Here's an example. I'm thinking about my thinking. So metacognition is simply thinking about thinking. Metacognition can be divided into two groups or two classifications. The first of these is primary and the second, other second of these is secondary. So metacognition may be divided into primary and secondary metacognition. Primary metacognition refers to thinking that occurs at a direct level of cognition. These uh, involve our initial associations of an object. An example might be the sky is blue, the car is green, that person is nice. Hey, this TV show is really cool. That's, that's primary metacognition, the, the first initial association of an object. Secondary metacognition involves reflection upon our primary thoughts. So secondary metacognition involves reflection about our primary metacognition. An example might be, was the sky really blue or was it a turquoise color? What does that color mean about the weather? So primary is the initial association and secondary is reflection about the initial association. So metacognition involves primary and secondary aspects. Secondary metacognition can intensify or change the impact of primary thoughts and produce changes in thoughts, feelings, or actions. For example, you have these two people here, the little green guy and the little blue girl. And the little, little uh, green guy may now go in and evaluate or reflect upon his thoughts about the blue girl. Why do I dislike her? Have you ever met somebody that you just disliked the first time you met them? And now you, you begin to reflect upon it and you think, well, why did I dislike them so much? So why do I dislike her? It's secondary metacognition. Maybe I was wrong. That's secondary metacognition. Actually, she's a nice person, more secondary metacognition, and I will be nice to her. So you saw in that flow of uh, secondary metacognition a chain of, of thought and reflection that brought about a change in behavior. First, he disliked her. Then he began to question why he disliked her, decided that maybe she was a nice person, and then he decided to be nice to her. So behavior changed as a result of the impact of secondary metacognition. Now, metacognition can be divided into three primary factors. There's metacognitive knowledge, metacognitive monitoring, and metacognitive control. The first of these, metacognitive knowledge, refers to an individual's beliefs about thinking. An example, I can remember names through association. So when I meet somebody, the first thing I do is what do I associate them with? Uh, I met a person the other day, real easy to remember his name, because I associate it with my cousin's name. And immediately when I met him, I said, oh, what's his name, what's his name? I've got to remember that. So I said, oh, I, I know I can remember it if I associate it with something. Be careful what you associate them with, though. You don't want to come up with their name as Aardvark or something like that. Okay, metacognitive knowledge refers to an individual's beliefs about thinking. Metacognitive monitoring refers to evaluating one's thoughts via some personal standard. For example... Uh, I should not be so quick to judge others until I have stood in their shoes. In other words, I'm thinking, but I'm looking at what I'm thinking and measuring what I am thinking about certain standards that I have adopted. And my standard in this case is that I shouldn't judge people until I've stood in their shoes. So I monitor my judgmental thoughts against that person. Metacognitive control refers to the regulation of one's own thoughts. Example, I'm having a bad day. I need to be more positive. You ever said that to yourself? Man, I'm, I'm just having a bad day. I need to be more positive with other people. That's metacognitive control. 
Now, social metacognition can be used to reference thoughts that originate or are shared by members of a specified social group. I want you to observe this picture just a minute. Over here on, on the side, you have my relatives. On the other side, you have a raccoon. Now, this specified social group of my relatives in East Texas see that raccoon and say it looks like food to us. Mm -mm. What good barbecue. We might have a group of city people that see the raccoon, and they say, isn't he cute? Because the, the thoughts that are shared across theirs is this is a little animal that lives in a zoo, and it's a cute little animal. We might have a group of chicken farmers who say, man, what a pest. All of these groups looked at an object and had uh, some thoughts that originated or that were shared by a specified social group. Now, social metacognition can also refer to thoughts that are shared with or communicable with other people. They didn't just originate with them, but they can be communicated to other people. I want you to look at this picture just a moment. We have a group of school children and we have a teacher. And school children are very quick to, to communicate to their friends that it's us versus them. All of us against the teacher might be something that would be communicated. Social metacognition can refer to shared realities or thoughts across cultures, groups, etc. that transcend the individual. City people might, for example, look at this ain't eater and they say, we don't eat aardvarks. That's kind of shared their shared reality. They go to the grocery store. There are no aardvark meat there. They go to the restaurant. They don't serve aardvark. So they kind of collectively make the decision that we don't eat aardvarks. Uh, it can uh, be something like this, just a minute. And this is a very interesting picture. You have three little red guys and you have a purple uh, woman. And all purple people are bad. Does that remind you of any of the bias and hatred that we see in our day and age and bigotry that goes on out there? Hmm, all purple people are bad. Uh, social metacognition can be the target of persuasion and social influence. Uh, you might have the same situation that says, we should give people a chance before we judge them. In other words, in social metacognition, you can target specific thoughts and persuade or influence those thoughts in a different direction. Now, in summary, I just want to hit the highlights uh, of social metacognition as we introduced it. Metacognition refers to an individual's thinking about his or her own thoughts. Uh, primary metacognition refers to thinking that occurs at a direct level of cognition. These involve our initial associations of an object. Secondary metacognition involves reflection upon primary thoughts. And metacognition can be divided into three primary factors, knowledge, monitoring, and control. A social metacognition can be used to reference thoughts that originate or are shared by members of a specified social group. Social metacognition can refer to thoughts that are shared with or are communicable with other people, and social metacognition can refer to shared realities or thoughts across cultures, groups, etc. that transcend the individual. And in closing, social metacognition can be the target of persuasion and social influence. Uh, again, I want to thank you very much for your patronage and watching this video. I hope you found it informative. We will continue our discussions of social metacognition. As always, may the odds be ever in your favor, unless you and I are in the same event, then it's ever man for himself. Have a blessed day.